Hello, everyone. I, I'm Peter Brimelow. I'm the editor of VDare.com, and I'm coming to you from the conference room uh, of the VDare ca Castle, the Berkeley Springs Castle in Berkeley Springs, West Virginia. Uh, in about uh, a month, we're going to have our, our uh, uh, I think, third conference here, uh, third spring conference here, uh, April 26th, 28th. Uh, I know it's coming up quickly because they're just putting immense pressure on me to get my hair cut. Uh, in fact, I should have had it done by today. Um, and uh, I, I should take the opportunity to say that uh, this castle, this, the conference is sold out and there is a waiting list. Uh, there's obviously a great pent-up demand for distant conferences in this country, and, and uh, we're able to supply because we have bought our own venue. Um, live stream tickets are available, uh, but because of the reign of terror, uh, we're, we're currently between credit card processors. Um, the way in which you buy a live stream uh, ticket, uh, you can of course send a check, uh, and I believe the details are on the screen on the side. But you can also send an e-check. Um, just make it for ninety nine dollars and ninety nine cents, and we know we'll know that you uh, you what you want a live stream ticket, uh, and you could also email Lydia uh, uh, lbrimelow at vdare dot com. Now uh, I'm very fortunate today to have one of our speakers at the conference, uh, who has emerged as a, a world historical figure in the last year or so. Um, he's Keith Woods uh, uh, from Ireland. How are you doing, Keith? Hey Peter, it's it's great to be here. That that has to be my favorite intro yet, I must say. <laughs> we actually Keith has just told me the very unwelcome news to me that there are now traffic jams in Galway. I remember Galway uh in the early nineteen sixties. I spent quite a lot of time in Ireland then. And it was wonderful. Uh and in the west of Ireland you were actually drive into towns in those days and find dogs asleep in the middle of the road. But I guess they don't do that anymore, is that right? No, um, Galway City is actually one of the most congested cities in Europe, even though it's quite a small city um, and they've, they've done things to remedy that. But uh, we had a we had the Green Party in government for a time here. So there was a, a big road plan that was actually cancelled because it was going to uh, affect the local snail population. So still kind of stuck at loggerheads with the traffic problem. And you're from that area, aren't you? Yeah, not not Galway, but I grew up in in the west of Ireland, and I, I went to university in Galway. So yeah, I'm quite familiar with the west of Ireland. Keith gave a wonderful speech at the um, uh, at the Amrin conference last year, which, among other things, uh, revealed to me that there are tensions within the Irish community. Essentially, uh, people in the west don't like Dublin, which is really comes home to me because I'm a northerner and uh, from the north of England. And, uh, you know, we never got on with people in London. Uh, and I guess in this recent referendum, uh, there was a, it was a, a Dublin constituency uh, district was, was the only one that voted against the referendum. Uh, isn't that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dunleary was the only constituency that voted for it. I mean, the referendum was, uh, it was two referenda. It was about changing the language of the constitution. Um, and this is kind of a, bug, a big bugbear of, of uh, Irish liberals is the Irish constitution, you know, was, was created while Eamon de Valera was president. And, you know, liberals have this kind of caricatured view of it that it was like de Valera and the bishops wrote this and it really represents old Ireland. So they wanted to change the language to take out the language about you know the special place of mothers the irish family and to bring in this gender neutral language and i mean i was shocked i, I honestly thought it would pass at first just because you know the uh, the gay marriage and the abortion referendum and, and, and they just had so many successes like this but it was total rejection like over 70 percent and every constituency except one as you said which was uh, dunleary in south dublin um and in that speech, called kingstown like, right yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, I was actually drawing on um, Desmond Fennell in that speech, who, who was a, sort of a nationalist intellectual uh, that was quite prominent here in, in like the 70s, 80s. And it was him uh, him and John Waters started talking about this uh, idea of like the D4, the Dublin 4 liberal. And he called them the state class, um, because I think that's something that's unique about Ireland. I mean, I know in, in the UK, obviously, London is, is the big financial cultural center. But in Ireland, like we really had a focused, concentrated uh, media and Fennell called it the state class. And it's, you know, this area of South Dublin that produces the civil servants, the influential journalists, um, 
you know, the, the high ranking bankers and so on. And he always saw this kind of disconnect between these people's vision of things and the rest of Ireland. And it was always kind of a shame there about the rest of Ireland, which was more nationalist, more Catholic. And people were sharing around some clips of, of Fennel after the referendum talking about this, because it seems so prophetic when you look at the result and see that, yes, like there is there is the rest of the country. And then there's this little pocket of sort of upper middle class South Dublin. But there's such a power imbalance in terms of uh, the influence over, over the culture in Ireland in the past few decades. I would say there's something similar going on in English Canada, actually. I think Canada mm. is, is dominated by what they call Central Canada, specifically Ottawa and Toronto. Uh, and, and they're able to basically push them, because, partly because of the way their constitution works, there's no effective Senate. They're able to push the rest of the country around. But you're right, this is a very striking victory, because, of course, the other thing that's happened in Ireland is that I think it was the first country to pass homosexual marriage, wasn't it? In a, a, yeah, the, the first, the first, the first to pass it through a, a popular referendum. Right. So, you know, I, I, and they do see those kinds of things as, you know, it's a great badge of honor, I think, for the average liberal that that you can take a country like Ireland that that was so religious, so conservative until relatively recently, right, and that they will, you know, give the stamp of approval to things like gay marriage. So. Yeah, I think they all expected this referendum was going to be the same thing. You know, every establishment political party was in favor of it. Very little uh, dissent within the media. Um, and so really the only way to, to read it, I think, is is just kind of a popular rejection of, of the liberal consensus, uh, general populist upswell against the government, against the regime. Um, so I think it's a positive development. Like, I don't think they would have ever gone ahead with this if they thought there was a chance it was going to be rejected, you know? So Sort of like Brexit, in fact. Mm. It's a symbolic issue, uh, unlike Brexit, but it it, it, uh, it just took the elite by surprise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, you know, it's interesting now, I mean, just yesterday I was posting about this, that they seem to have given up on the hate speech bill. And that, I think that's a similar reasoning, is they've just got rejected in this referendum. Almost 80% of... Yeah, almost 80 percent of the Irish people, and I think a lot of people didn't even understand. Can you say t tell us what? Frankly. Tell us about the hate speech bill. It's, it's, it's extremely radical. Although I think the Canadians' proposals may be now more radical. But but what actually what actually, and then you played a major role, uh, I guess partly thanks to Elon Musk in in in, uh, in uh, raising consciousness about it. But can you tell us what it would have done? Yeah, I mean, in some senses, it is just kind of catching Ireland up with the rest of of, of Western Europe. Um, and this was certainly encouraged by certain European institutions. But in some ways, it does go further than other hate speech laws in that, you know, if you have material on a device and there isn't even intent to distribute it, that potentially you could face jail. So, I mean, this is kind of similar to what we're seeing in, in Belgium recently. Dries van Langenhove, who, who also spoke at, at Amran, is, is facing jail because he was in a group chat where offensive memes were shared. So that's the kind of thing where we were talking he didn't, about. He these... didn't say these things. He, he, he just, somebody in the group chat he was in was posting them. Yeah. And I mean, just, you know, reading about the case, it's 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 really bizarre. I mean, the, you know, the judge was was literally saying he didn't do enough to, to stop people posting this stuff. Um, it's just baffling. Um, and, you know, I mean, by the standards of, of the Internet, not even very, very offensive stuff. But, yeah, it was it was all that kind of thing. It was, you know, if there is an intent to distribute material, you can be punished for it. Um, again, the very subjective idea of hate, where if any individual is offended on behalf of any protected group that you could face persecution. And yeah, I mean, I, I think I probably did have a, a big role in, in starting some kind of conversation about it because this has been going through the legislative process for like four or five years. And, you know, the complicity of the media, very little debate about it. I don't think people knew how radical it was. No opposition from any of the major parties. Um, when I tweeted about it last year, my tweet just highlighting the worst sections of it, especially the kind of thought crime section is what I called it. Um, you know, if, if you have something you don't intend to distribute it. Uh, that tweet got 12 million views. Musk responded. Donald Trump Jr. responded. Uh, Jordan Peterson reposted it. And it did kind of start a conversation here. You know, there was news coverage that week talking about Musk's intervention and Donald Trump Jr.'s intervention. Um, I think that encouraged 
you know, other conservatives and nationalists in Ireland that were opposed to this bill to have a kind of rallying point. Because the problem with this kind of stuff is, is you know, it's like I said, it's four years going through a legislative process. The majority of the country is it was always against it according to any polls that were done on it. But it's like, how do you turn that into something real? Like, there's no single political party. Uh, you can't really do a, a big protest about this. Um, so there was never really a rallying point until then. And I think that week, it put it in the conversation. Suddenly, they started debating it on TV and radio. Irish nationalist Twitter users got behind this. They started a hashtag bin the bill um, hashtag. Uh, Elon Musk began interacting with with more figures in the Irish scene. He he talked to uh, Grip, which is a conservative publication here. So it did create a, a kind of you know a, a spiral, and it brought this to the front of of populist messaging here. And then what sparked a change? I mean, I honestly would never have expected that this could be reversed because it had already gone through the the first House of Parliament doll. All there, and then all it has to do is go through the Senate, and they can't really reject a the bill. They could suggest amendments, but it's it's kind of a symbolic house. Um, but the senators reported record numbers of of letters and emails, and you know the public outcry seemed to have an effect on them taking a second look at this. And then it was delayed. It was meant to pass in the summer. It was kind of put on the back burner for a while. Then we're coming up to an election. This referendum just happened, and. Sinn Féin come out and suddenly flip their position and say they're against the bill because they know it's going to be, uh, you know, it's it's kind of a populist talking point for the election. And then last night, two government ministers from the two coalition parties say, yeah, this bill is dead in the water. So I was shocked at that. Um, I mean, it's it's not a complete victory yet. You know, the, the soon to be new Taoiseach or, or prime minister here says he still wants some kind of hate speech bill, but he says in its current form, it's not going to happen. And even if they're to draft something new, you know, that's another three, four years legislative process. He may not even be uh, in power after the next election. So I think it's a it's a huge victory. Like I said, I would never have expected that we could reverse it. But I really do think it was the kind of coordinated action of of Irish nationalist populists um, pushing back against this, organizing campaigns, pressuring, pressuring politicians. And finally, the referendum result. That, you know, at the end of the day, these politicians, they care about enforcing this stuff and, and they care about being up to these European standards. But there's self-interest there and they don't want to get wiped out at the next election. And I think the referendum sent a, sig a signal to them that, you know, the mood isn't where it was three, four years ago. Well, you have really have what seems to be like a uni party in Ireland now. And I guess Sinn Féin is almost part of it. I mean, there, there, there is there is mm -hmm. no... Uh, uh, real de debate on these and these major issues. Is that right? Oh yeah, absolutely. And you know, it, it's interesting because the dynamic is a lot different in in Ireland to other parts of Europe. I mean, other parts of Europe typically you have a kind of strong um, centre right sort of uh, what would have been like Christian conservative parties in in like the, the post World War Two, like the CDU in Germany, the Tories in Britain. And then you'll have a sort of centre-left social democracy party, Labour in Britain. Um, and then you'll have a couple of fringe left-wing parties. It's quite different in Ireland. There's never really been the, the big sort of fake uh, populist party or the big sort of centre-right party. Um, the political differences were fundamentally tribal, and it was on the side of the civil war, Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil. As far as policies go, it was very difficult to split them. I mean, they've had periods where... Fine Gael was, was more of a social democracy party, and then it was more of a sort of Thatcherite centre-right party, um, but very little difference. And so Sinn Féin kind of occupied that position of sweeping up populist sentiment that would otherwise go to um, anti-immigration parties in other countries, even though they're very left-wing, right? And and they, they, are, they do essentially embrace an open borders agenda. They're uh, Marxists in many aspects. But the weird thing is, and this is what people miss a lot when they say, oh, well, you know, Irish nationalism in Ireland, look how left wing it is and it's trans rights and all this. But if you look at the, the polling of Sinn Féin supporters, they actually have the highest rates of being opposed to immigration, being opposed to the liberal agenda. So there's a weird kind of disconnect. And I think it just comes down to really low information voters that just associate Sinn Féin with populism, with nationalism for obvious reasons. And, you know, Sinn Féin have never been in power, so they can't be blamed for immigration. 
And a lot of people just kind of assume that, well, Sinn Féin or the Nationalist Party did do a populist agenda that shut down the borders. And kind of for understandable reasons, because even, you know, as recently as, as like 10 years ago, Sinn Féin did appeal to a lot of sort of uh, what would be considered like right wing populist talking points. They've always been sort of Eurosceptic. Um, and there's been a rapid transformation, especially the last few years. So I think that's uncharted territory for a nationalist movement here is Sinn Féin could be the biggest party after the next election. It seems like eventually they will be in government. And at a certain point, a lot of those voters that are very opposed to immigration rank it as a top concern, but are supporting Sinn Féin. At a certain point, they're going to abandon Sinn Féin in very, very large numbers, I believe. And it's going to create a huge gap for an actual populist alternative. Um, and that, that, I think that's kind of the most interesting trend that will happen here in the next few years. Yes. Do you see now there are there are uh, small nationalist parties, nationalist in a true sense, uh, ethno nationalist mm -hmm. parties that are emerging. Is that right? Yeah, um, I mean, the National Party, the Irish Freedom Party, a, a few of these parties, they've, they've been around for a few years, like maybe 2016, 17. But obviously, the last few months, the last couple of years, all that has happened with the, the very high profile resettlements of, of asylum seekers in, in small local areas, the community movements that have popped up in opposition to that, just a general rise in populism. Um, they've gained a lot of momentum the last few months and the last couple of years. And now, of course, the challenge is to turn that into political gain in the next election. And historically, that's that's been very difficult. You know, again, these things don't always go one to one exactly as you expect, where, well, the country right now, according to polls, ranks immigration as their top concern uh, above health care, above housing, above all these things. And 75 percent plus said the country is taking too many immigrants. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes it's, it's difficult to translate that into uh, electoral success here for various reasons. And again, um, historical things in Ireland, people often vote more uh, based on sort of local issues, based on their uh, sort of affinity for individual candidates, rather than thinking on the kind of national level, change the country's ideological direction. But I think we will definitely see, there's upcoming local elections, I think we'll see a lot of nationalists elected, especially in kind of more working class areas that you've seen come out in, in opposition to immigration heavily, like uh, places in North Dublin. Um, I think the National Party is is uh, is really promising right now. You know, the, the, the membership is very party. young. Yeah, the membership the is leader? very young. Uh, the leader is James Reynolds. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because he's, he's quite rural and he has a, a history of working in farmers' organizations. And he's very well able to speak to the concerns of, of farmers in rural Ireland um, and, and tap into that kind of populism against the agenda being pushed by the EU. Uh, and then at the same time, you have a very strong base of, of people from Dublin, uh, working class people that are opposed to this. So I think, I think it's a good time for the National Party to make ground. And like I said, the membership is, is very young, uh, very active members. And, you know, I think this could be, hopefully, this will be the year where it starts to turn into electoral success. It's, it, it, remind me, is it proportional representation or is it a first-past-the-post system? It's proportional representation. So, for, so I mean, that, that's good. That's very good, of course. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, even, um, like, I remember after the financial crisis in the early 2010s, it was the 2011 general election, and, you know, independent TDs uh, were like uh, something like a fifth of, of the people elected. So it, it is it's a lot easier in a case like that, where that was a case where there was huge anger over the, the running of the economy. There was a, a lot of hatred against the establishment parties and there were all these kind of populist independent types getting elected. And that is the good thing about PR is is it makes it much easier to for that to happen in a constituency. You know, you can get elected on a, a fourth count or fifth count. And I think if you look at the history of Britain, the UK, I think you see that a lot of there's a lot of nationalist parties that maybe could have stuck around for longer or maybe could have turned into a real movement if not for just being so locked out by the, the first past the post system. Right. What I saw in Canada was uh, that uh, it's very difficult to get a new party started. 
and you can get mm. quite large numbers of votes with no with no seats. But then suddenly it will flip once you go get once you get past a certain critical mass. So that, for example, the Conservative Party in Canada, which was absolutely wiped out at the end of Mulroney's uh, reign, uh, it was reduced to two seats. And I think that could perhaps happen in Britain. The, the, the Tory party seems to have run itself into the wall in Britain. Now, who's going to replace them? I don't, at the moment, I don't see any, there doesn't seem to be any, um, I, I guess a lot of a lot of nationalists in Britain are, are, are very demoralised by the betrayal of Brexit and, and, and uh, also of the, the, the Tory victory in 2019, which was a national conservative victory. It's just that they didn't govern that way. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, it's very interesting looking at the polling in, in Britain. I mean, the last... Uh, seat projection that was done put the conservatives at something like nine seats i mean it it, it would be pr pretty much a, a wipeout and it's weird because from what i've heard if, if you look at the how those seats break down in terms of the tories that will actually get elected it's the kind of one nation conservatives like the very the actual very like liberal uh conservatives you know they're they almost could be like liberal democrats um so you know on that basis also you wouldn't think well it's going to lead to some big kind of um populist flip in, in the Conservative Party or something. So, yeah, the ground is there for for uh, an alternative, but it's just, you know, it's just so hard to, to build anything in the UK. I mean, look at what happened to uh, Sam Amelia, Patriotic Alternative, right. jailed for two years for stickers. I think Patriotic Alternative have, have not been able to register with the Electoral Commission. They've run into a lot of trouble there. The, the electoral commission is just simply not allowing them to 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 to, be, to, be, to register as a party. It's kind of a weird thing. You actually have to be officially recognised to 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 run as a to have a, to be a party. Yeah, uh, and Michael Gove, who's a, a conservative, um, he's a member of the Conservative government, um, and supposedly was actually. Uh, <laughs> personally acquainted with Jonathan Bowden. Uh, there's been some right. articles on that, but he, he named Patriotic Alternative in the parliament as, as an, ex an extremist group, and he named them alongside uh, like uh, radical Islamist groups. So, I mean, the UK state is always kind of hinting that they could potentially ban Patriotic Alternative. I mean, there's just so many, there's so many legal obstacles in, in Britain to building anything like that. You know, that's why you, when you see things like the hate speech laws coming in Ireland, it's like you, you have to win on these battles because at a certain point, they just have so much legislation that they can stop anything getting off the ground. that it's like, even if there is an opening, like what's happening with the Conservatives, it's, it's very hard to build anything organically. Right. The, 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 we're not without that problem here. You know, I tried very hard uh, uh, 10 years ago to get Jared Taylor for American Renaissance to run in Virginia 10, which at that time was a district uh, control uh, um, represented by absolutely useless rhino, as they call them here, Barbara Comstock. Mm. And I want him to either run against her in the primary or alternatively run against her in the general election, and draw enough votes off to, to, to uh, get her defeated, as she subsequently was anyway. But it turned out that to uh, for, for Jared to register, apart from having to put a lot of money up, he had to get quite a large number of signatures, uh, maybe five mm. or 10,000 signatures, which you could have gotten, of course, except the fact that these signatures would, would then be public, and people who signed mm. up for him to run in in, um, in 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 the election would, of course, then be subject to Twitter mobs and and and, and social uh, social mob cancelling and all this kind of thing. The you know social credit you know the social credit system that we have here now, where people are punished for having the wrong opinions by uh, by banks and things. So it's a really formidable obstacle to to uh, to get in. Um, you know, a uh, distant candidate, uh, 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 at least in Virginia, uh, it's it's easy in some other states because the states all have different rules. Uh, but the, they have, you know, there are the, the there's there is a sort of institutional closure going on that's designed to prevent challenges to the system. But tell me, tell me about your own career. You started, you were with Sinn Fein at one point, weren't you? Oh, I joined Sinn Féin when I was, I, I think I was probably 16 at the time um, and, and you know, kind of quickly got got disillusioned. But uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, the, there's always been kind of a weird, uh, there's been a weird thing with Sinn Féin where they're, they're not quite, uh, they're not quite leftists, they're not quite nationalists, they kind of blur the lines, they're kind of uh, amorphous in how they appeal to, to sort of populist instincts. But yeah, certainly when I joined in the early 2010s, I mean, immigration wasn't even even really an issue. It was all about economics. It was just after the, the financial crash. Um, and since then, obviously, it's it's exploded. But yeah, I think I'm, I'm probably like a lot of uh, 
ex Sinn Féin members that realised it's uh, quickly realised it's like a, a leftist open borders party and, and moved on to something else. You see that in this country now. I'm always surprised how many people I meet, meet young people who actually worked for and voted for Obama and then realise mm. that, that quite quickly that there's no, there's no place for whites in the, in the modern Democratic, or at least white Gentiles in the modern Democratic Party. Uh, and, and, and then have moved over to the right quite, quite dramatically. Uh, uh, and similarly, of course, I mean, you know, the, the, a lot of uh, there's still a residual white working class vote for the Democrats. But the, the fact is, it's not a white working class party in any sense. And I, th I think that realization is, you know, dawns on people even subliminally. I mean, where we are here in West Virginia, um, the, this was a, a rock hard Democratic state until very recently. I mean, I think uh, Carter beat Reagan here in 1980, but. Um, Donald Trump carried uh, uh, West Virginia in 2020 by more than 50 points. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are a lot of young white men that historically would have been in the left that would not touch it now. And you, you already see a lot of, you know, normal young white guys with leftist parties. I mean, even if you've ever seen pictures of like the youth groups of of say the Labour Party here in Britain or Sinn Fein. You know, it is a certain type, like they're, <laughs> it doesn't look like your average guy, if you know what I mean. Um, and like, you know, I think back, I mean, when I got interested in, in, in sort of leftist politics when I was, when I was quite young, I mean, like I said, it was all economics focused, you know, it was just stuff like Thomas Piketty and, and the, the financial crash and, you know, Occupy Wall Street and and this like oh we should have the the Scandinavian model of of uh, social democracy versus this more uh, uh, Thatcherite model you know these kinds of abstract questions because immigration just didn't really register as an issue I mean I grew up in an area that was you know totally homogeneous and you know, you look back and it's like well once immigration becomes an issue that that kind of luxury of of focusing on the, on those kinds of uh, abstract economic questions I mean it takes a back seat at a certain point. But I would certainly imagine there's a lot of people that, you know, if, if the left was about economic issues or was about any of these things, they might be attracted to it. But I think at a certain point in the 2010s, when the trans stuff was so front and center and BLM, I mean, there is something to be said for like, this stuff just isn't cool. It's not appealing to young guys. Like it's very, uh, you know, it's very feminine. It's 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 very self-hating, um, and I I did kind of observe that that shift myself. Even like you know, people I, I would have known from university. Like at a certain point, the left has, it's gotten very stuffy and establishment and and sort of rules based, um, and I think I think they will struggle to attract sort of ordinary white guys in the future. Of course, that's not so much a problem for them because they they have so many uh, new arrivals to staff it. But I, I definitely think that's a trend. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the growth. But young white men are really the growth point in society. They're the ones who have all the ideas and do all the work. So it's very difficult to, for, to, to build a party that, that, I mean, in the long run, it's, it's, it's a bad thing to drive, drive young white men away. We have a certain, mm -hmm. James Carville, you know, who was a, a political operative here, uh, was very prominent in the, in the Clinton years, just recently gave an interview on, 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 when he said that the problem is the Democratic Party has been taken over by, I think he said, bossy women too many bossy women in the Democratic Party, and it turns people off. Uh, and, and uh, of course, you know, th that's exactly what you're saying, isn't it? Become a fe feminized... No, no, I mean, that, that's definitely real. I mean, because when you're, I mean, when you're like 16, 17, 18, stereo getting into politics, you, you kind of want something rebellious. You, you kind of want something with a bit of, bit of oomph. I mean, even like when, it, you know, when I was first getting interested in politics and I was drawn to Sinn Féin, like there's something appealing about the controversy of, of, you know, all the establishment parties would say like, they'll never go into government with them that sort of attacked them for the IRA associations. It's like, you know, this isn't your ordinary uh, sort of bourgeois politics, but yeah, you know, when that is instead, um, like you said, a bossy HR lady, like wagging her finger at you, telling you, you know, to respect her pronouns and, and use use the correct gender language. I mean, at a certain point, it just loses any appeal unless you're you're kind of a a very uh, you know a very weird individual yourself. So yeah, I I do think that's you know maybe it's not top of the list of, of problems for the left, but I do think it's somewhat a problem. Like you said, you know, the the young white guys do bring the the leadership, the organizational skill, the new ideas, and certainly the left, uh, as far as ideas go, is is very stagnant right now. 
Tell me, uh, I'm of course amazed by your uh, meteoric rise on Twitter. Uh, I, I, I guess it's called X, isn't it now? Uh, what, I, I, are you amazed by this? When did you get up? When did you start on, on, on X? Well, I, I made one in 2019. That's when I originally joined Twitter. Um, and it was only because someone was like, I, I, you know, I was a YouTuber and someone was like, well, you need to be on Twitter if you want to, you know, get guests and reach out to people. That's what everyone is on. So, you know, find me at Twitter. Um, I got banned in 2021, which is when the Bannon was kind of at its peak then. Um, you know, Jack Dorsey stepped down and, and it was, it was, you know, everyone was getting banned. Um, I only got brought back on the 1st of April last year. Uh, so I was kind of actually laid in, in the Musk uh, Let me ask you, when you brought back, do they send you an, an email and say you're allowed, now allowed back on or did you just notice that you were back on? Uh, I got an email, yeah. I mean, I, I had been sending um, appeals for, you know, six months, ever since Elon Musk took over. And there'd been wave after wave of reinstatements. And he'd let back, you know, far more controversial people than I. You know, Ang Andrew Anglin was brought back and, and some of these people. So at that point, I was like, it's it's probably over, you know. Um, but then, yeah, 1st of April, I was brought back, like I said, very late. I had 20,000 followers at the time, I think. And yeah, I mean, it's it's been huge. I mean, I'm at 175 now. So, you know, you do the math, like I got 20,000 in, in, you know, two and a half years versus 150,000 in less than a year. Um, and I think a big part of that is just that he removed a lot of the shadow banning that existed on on uh, Twitter of old. I don't think all of it is gone. And, um, you know, there were periods in the last year where I was able to get a, a bigger audience and the, the algorithm seems to change all, all the time. I think that was a big part of it, but also just kind of being off uh, Twitter for a couple of years. Um, you know, I realized that the power that is there uh, if you push our message in the right way. And I thought a lot about how to um, get that message out there if I ever did return. But yeah, definitely beyond my wildest expectations, uh, stuff that happened last year, stuff like, you know, ban the ADL. And like I said, um, the sort of international attention on, on the hate speech bill so I think there's a lot of reason to be optimistic, certainly in the online space. You know, I mean, not everyone has been brought back. A lot of people are still suspended. But I don't know if you agree, but I just get the feeling like month on month logging into Twitter, it seems like our ideas are getting more and more normalized. I think there's still quite a lot of shadow banning. But I also mm. think that you have a knack to do this, which I, a knack of, 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 of tweeting, which, you know, is, there's something that you're doing which is really remarkable. I mean, what, what are your rules? I mean, for example, one new thing is apparently you're not supposed to link to outside sites, are you? Mm. You're, supposed to, you're supposed to just make comments and keep people on Twitter. Of course, that limits its usefulness from that VDES point of view because we want, we want to disseminate um, our articles because we want to get around, around Google, Google shadow banning. Uh, but mm. uh, but did you follow that? You just make comments and don't you do link to things a lot, don't you? Um, not so much anymore, actually. Um, I, I mean, it actually depends on the platform. If if you're linking another social media platform like YouTube, uh, Facebook, or something, they really kill that. And Elon uh, had a bit of a falling out with Substack, so he totally killed Substack links. So I actually bought a link for my Substack, like an independent link, so Twitter doesn't register it as a Substack link. But generally, yeah, avoid in links. I mean, basically all these platforms have changed their algorithm to maximize the amount of time people spend on them, which makes sense. So they don't want you going to any other platform. They don't want you going to YouTube. Um, all of the changes Elon made is intended to make X this kind of self-contained ecosystem. You go there for news, you go there for video, you go there for streams, you go there for uh, job applications they're doing now. So they've, they've changed the algorithm in that way. But I mean, I, I don't know. I just, uh, you know, I kind of see what works. So just a lot of A-B testing, um, you know, seeing the, the format that appeals to people and, and just kind of, you know, running with that. Uh, I think, you know, like anything, you, you just uh, get a feel for it at a certain point. Um, but yeah, there is there's still definitely a lot of shadow banning. And I mean, the, the frustrating thing is, is that nothing really gets explained. I mean, I remember in, in October last year, I suddenly got this ghost ban where if you read replies to my tweets, you couldn't see my tweet. 
my engagement went to 10% of what it was. And this just lasted for two weeks and then it disappeared and was back to normal again. So there's all sorts of weird things like this happening under the surface um, that Elon has committed to getting rid of. He says it's a very difficult process, um, but there we go. I guess it just shows how how badly the, the last platform was set up against us. And are you still not working using Gab? No, I haven't gone on to Gab yet. Um, you know, I, I, when I was banned off Twitter, Telegram was my main platform, and I actually enjoyed Telegram a lot. I think Telegram is a really good platform, actually, but it's just never, it never has the discoverability of, there's something about X where, you know, you get people from other perspectives thrown onto your feed, you can interact with everyone. It really is the public square. Telegram is much more, you know, you go, go to the people you know, you follow their feed. Um, so yeah, that was kind of my go-to out, outside of Twitter. But uh, who knows? Maybe the you know maybe the battle days of censorship will will come back and and uh, Gab will be uh, at the last. We make a point of, of continually cross-posting to Gab whenever we do a tweet, an X or whatever they call it now. Uh, partly because uh, we, we're very fond of Andrew Torber, who's been here at the castle, and of course it's Gab Pay, which is making a heroic effort to rescue uh, our credit card uh, facility. Which is revealed that in fact it's not the the payment processes that that are the, are the problem. It's it's the banks. And we in fact believe the federal regulators are, are, are putting pressure on the banks to to stop um, patriot groups uh, from from flourishing, uh, just as they're trying to stop uh, you know suppress gun sales, gun, the, the gun trade in, in this country. But uh, as I say, uh, uh, I, I want to put in a word for, 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 for Gab, and I urge you to, uh, Kate, to, 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 to at least cross-post to it. But tell us where you actually are now on, on, on social media. Or anywhere. Well, how, how do people watch what you do? Yeah, um, I mean, my original platform was YouTube, and, and by some miracle, I'm, I'm still up there. <laughs> I had to take a lot of videos down, probably... Uh, Less than half the the videos I've ever made are currently Were public. Were they struck, or did you just, or did you just take them down prudentially? Well, recently there was a Media Matters hit piece on me that uh, specifically targeted Buy Me a Coffee and YouTube because they identified that that's where I was getting revenue from. So you know, I'm on lots of platforms, but they they wanted to target these because they wanted to take away my revenue. And so, you know, he included uh, screenshots of me getting super chats and so on. So, ban me a coffee. Uh, buy me a coffee. Banned me. Um, and then YouTube, I said, well, okay, you know, the, typically what happens is Media Matters does a hit piece and someone gets banned instantly. So I said, I'm just going to private every video, politics related, I'll private everything mentioned in this. Surely they can't ban me then. Well, wouldn't you know, they gave me three strikes for private videos that no one could view except myself and the uh, the YouTube mod. So uh, it kind of shows there's, there's a little bit you can do to protect against... Uh, uh, getting stuff banned, but not a whole lot. But you know, but like I said, by, by some miracle, I'm still on YouTube. But uh, I've, I've, for a while now, I've been treating it as a, a platform that's maybe not long for this world. Um, but thankfully, Rumble has been turned out to be quite a, a good alternative, and I've you know I've gotten in the habit of of reuploading everything there. Um, this year, I've focused a lot more on Substack. I've been trying to write more long form. So if people want to check that out, it's uh, it's just KeithWoods.pub. Um, and yeah, I've I've been you know hammering out some essays this year. And that's a subscription. You, are you are you free on Substack or partly free or what? All, all my writing is public. I do a few um, you know discussions, uh, book clubs, that kind of thing that I give to members. But all, all the actual essays I write are public. Tell me, uh, Substack. How do you how do you is it tied up with Stripe? I mean, can, or does it have its own payment processors? Yeah, it's Stripe, and Stripe, you know, again, yeah, yeah well, that's, you know, the, that's the usual, bad news the usual... for us because Stripe has just banned us. Uh, yeah, although I, I I gather it's because they're under pressure from the banks. But but yeah, uh, I was about to say the the usual issues with the platform, and you know, because Substack has been quite good for not banning people. They've got a lot of pressure from media outlets and so on. But the good thing about Substack is. They're not reliant on advertising revenue the way something like Twitter is. So, you know, the ADL, SPLC, these groups can do a pressure campaign and get advertisers to pull revenue. And then companies like Facebook, like Twitter, have to relent at a certain point. 
with Substack, there isn't really advertising. It's, you know, their whole revenue model is subscriptions. So they're very, there's not really a lot these organizations can do. You know, they can write hit pieces. Some liberals have boycotted Substack. But it doesn't really affect their bottom line, you know, and, and people go there because it's free speech. But yes, this is the problem. As always, there's a payment processor that can be pressured. And, you know, you've just said you were banned on Stripe. I've seen a lot of that recently. I don't know if you saw, I mean, Libs of TikTok, Chaya Raishik, she was banned off of uh, Stripe a couple of weeks ago. I think they ago. backed off of that, though, didn't they? Did I they? Think... Perhaps. I hadn't heard that. Um, yeah. In her case, but my impression is that over here in the US, Sovereign, that Sovereign real... Bra, who's who's a, a big Twitter account, was banned off Stripe as well, and a handful of others. I know. Who was that? Uh, Sovereign Bra. He has like a couple of hundred thousand Twitter yeah, followers. Right. Um, a few different accounts like that, sort of uh, Christian-related accounts. Um, none that were very edgy, but yeah, I don't know where the pressure is coming from. But lately. Stripe seems to be getting almost as bad as PayPal for deplatforming, unfortunately. Right. I mean, it's, it's obviously coming from the regime. I mean, they're, 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 mm. they're, we lost YouTube and everything, and uh, in the run up to 2020 election, they just and uh, it turns out that they they made a systematic effort to suppress uh, uh, what they thought were pro Trump sites. Uh, mm. b before before the election, and I would say the same thing is going on now. I mean, like the in, in Ireland, for reasons which really bear examining the. The, the ruling class has suddenly, suddenly decided to go mad and import, you know, literally hundreds of thousands, millions in the U.S. of of, of, uh, of immigrants without any vetting at all. So uh, that they are facing a real serious backlash over that, and 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 they, so they're going to great lengths to suppress it. Uh, yeah, I remember 20, 2020 was crazy. I mean, I because I remember in 2020, you know, Amran was on YouTube, like you said, you guys were on YouTube, Stefan Molyneux, even right. Richard Spencer at YouTube channel. And like, yeah, I remember there was a period of, of a month or two in the summer where it was geared up for election season. And, you know, boom, 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 everyone was gone within like a couple of weeks. YouTube was just wiped out. And then Twitter, after that, began the mass bannings. So yeah, it's I guess it is ominous, right? We have another election where potentially uh, the the giant uh, orange fascist uh, that these people think is is going to create a, a white supremacist dictatorship. Yeah, uh, this is their last chance to stop him. So yeah, what what lens will they go to, right? I mean, what lens do you think they'll go to? Well, I mean, I guess we're lucky in the sense that Elon Musk has as Twitter because I think it would be, I mean. You know, Facebook is done. No one on our side seems to use Facebook anymore. I think Twitter would just have have been like every other platform, and you know that's the only hope right on now. Are you Facebook is, still? No, I've 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 never really used Facebook. Um, right. Back before I was even a public face, I used to have like Facebook type meme pages, but the, the censorship came there before anywhere else. But I mean, the only hope now is is you know we're gearing up for the election season, and some people have seen what was coming. I mean, Peter Thiel is invested in Rumble. Rumble have investors. They have their own cloud hosting service now, so they can't be deplatformed by by Amazon the way some other uh, social media companies. I think Parler was deplatformed from there. So yeah, Musk has Twitter. Like I said, Rumble exists, Substack exists. I mean, that seems to be the only hope unless Trump gets into power and, and passes some kind of internet bill of rights. Um, that would be the best possible outcome. I mean, I don't know if he'll deliver on it, but he did lay out a policy about tech censorship that I thought was really good. You know, I don't know who drafted it, but he was talking about, you know, no lifetime bans, an internet bill of rights. Anyone that's censored the platform would have to release the reason publicly. Yeah. Um, and it would be great. I mean, if he actually followed through on that and this was settled once and for all, it would take away the advertiser pressure. You know, they can't say, well, you have X, Y, Z person on your platform. Advertisers should abandon you because everyone is on there. I mean, that would be incredible um, because if we could speak censorship free, not, not only would the voices be back that could really make an impact. You know, you have people like Jared Taylor and so on back on these platforms, but also what people would say. I think there's a lot of people in the conservative movement that maybe they agree with us on a lot of things, but you know they have their payment processors, they have their big Twitter accounts, they have their big Instagram accounts, and that's an incentive. You know, that's an incentive not to stray too far in our direction. So I think that would be really transformative if, if the tech 
censorship issue could be solved once and for all. But until then, you know, it's it is just going to be the uh, the alternative platforms that are more censorship free. What do you what do you want to do yourself? Well, what are your uh, 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 you know career goals? Um, for, I mean, for now, it's more of the same. Uh, you know, get the get the message out to as many people as possible. Influence the influencers, influence people that can be influential. You know, I hear a lot from from young guys that come from all walks of life, uh, politics wise. That that uh, sort of came over to our politics and counter my content. That's great to hear. Like I said, I'm focused more on on writing this year, and I, I definitely want to uh, perfect that craft as, as much as I can and make something more long form. Um, you know, politics, I, I don't really see myself as like a, a, a leader in politics, but I certainly support uh, in any way I can uh, with the materials I have, uh, groups that I think can be successful. And um, yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting time right now to, to do this kind of thing. It seems like the, the conversation is, is changing rapidly. In Ireland, that's the National Party, is it, that you support? Yeah. The National Party, which, uh, like I said, I, I think the, the the next election potentially uh, could be a, a breakout for them. Well, tell us what you're going to talk about at the conference here. Uh, yeah, so I've been I've been thinking about this. I mean, the uh, the news that's happened lately in Europe kind of set this topic up well for me. I think, um, but I think the you know you said that the the sort of theme this year is is immigration being the, the queen of, of the battlefield, uh, like the, the chess analogy. Um, and so in the sense that, you know, if we lose on immigration, we lose on every other issue. I think I would like to focus on the issue of, of sort of uh, civil liberties and basic freedoms, which some people might be surprised, right? They think I'm like, a, I don't know, they think I'm like a, a communist or something. But I mean, if you look at the, the recent things that have happened in Europe that I mentioned, Dries van Lagenhove, going to jail for memes, basically. Sam Melia facing two, he is serving a two year jail sentence now for posting stickers online with messages like, it's okay to be white, love your country. Um, the hate speech laws in Ireland we've discussed. So there, there is a theme here. And even with the, the hate speech laws in Ireland, politicians explicitly said that this was related to the immigration issue. This was to manage a lot of the backlash that was coming organically against uh, the immigration problem. Um, and so I think, you know, the message will be, if you value liberty, if you value these freedoms, you should want nationalism, you should want a homogeneous society, because everywhere you have diversity, you can see these things erode in little ways. And it's not just the, you know, centralized, uh, you know, the, the laws, the, the bureaucratic institutions, um, the, the police type, type stuff, but even on, on the local level, um, you know, the, the, the greatest guarantee of, of a kind of safe, uh, trusted community is, is that, it's, that it's homogeneous and that uh, it's, it's uh, people that are familiar to yourself. So I think that could be a, an interesting topic to explore. Well, Keith, thanks so much for, for, for talking to me today and thanks so much for coming. Uh, you know, I think one of the really critical points about uh, a nascent movement is, is, is it, it needs to have meetings. It needs to be able to get together. And that's why we fought so hard to get this gathering space here at, uh, in, in Berkeley Springs. It, it is only an hour, two hours from the U.S. Capitol if you want to launch an stage insurrection. Uh, that's a joke, by the way. Uh, but, but we are, but it's a different world, and, and the people here are very supportive. God bless them. And uh, as I say, I think um, it's great. It's very important that we all meet together. One of the things that I, I discovered from meeting. Uh, in uh, you at America Renaissance, is that you're seven feet tall? Uh, is that actually how tall are you? Um, let's 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 say I'm six ten for the purposes of the stream. You go out <laughs> a little bit. No, I'm I'm about six four. I think last time I checked. I thought you were bigger than that. Um, uh, Lydia's father is six eight, and all of our three little girls are showing signs of being over six feet. So so they're working on it. They work. Lydia's six one. Um, well, it, it, it's great to have you on. I want to tell uh, um, uh, listeners again that uh, although we are sold out, uh, we will be having other conferences. And it's also possible to get a live stream ticket. Uh, uh, and you can get around, you can defeat the reign of terror by going to our um, 
our uh, e-check system and, and just enter, just paying $99.99, which we know is will be for a live stream ticket and, and we'll, be, we'll be in touch. Of course, you can still uh, snail mail checks in to, to the address that's on the site. Uh, Keith, is getting late for you, isn't it? So I better, I better yeah, let you go. But th thanks so much, thanks so much for speaking. And, and I to really look forward to seeing you again. No, hey, I enjoyed it. Thanks for having me on, Peter. And yeah, I'm looking forward to being at the conference. Thanks so much.